Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you again for those who've come out on such a chilly night. It's uh, very hard to believe that climate change isn't real, is it? Um, so tonight I'm talking about a, a very specific topic, which is uh, the advanced therapies in Parkinson's disease. And the, these are um, treatments that are used when oral therapies are not sufficient to manage Parkinson's alone. Now, oral under these circumstances, it's not that oral therapies fail, and I think there's a misconception that uh, if you indulge yourself by taking too many medications at the beginning of the disease, that they run out of steam and then you're left with nothing else. So that's not indeed the case at all. The medications will last um, according to the duration of time and there's no penalty for taking too little at the beginning or taking too much at the beginning. It's uh, really a feature of how the brain works uh, according to the stage of uh, Parkinson's and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So we're not talking about the problem of when the medications are no longer work, we're talking about the problems that the medications are still quite efficacious in correcting their main target but they're marred by involuntary movements and some psychological problems but they're also less reliable in working continuously and when those two features come together and despite the best efforts of uh, your therapeutic advisor to get the dosage right and your diligent compliance, they still work unreliably, then it's time to think about these advanced therapies. So I've shown this slide on many occasions, but the point about it is to mention that, or make it clear that these cells that uh, reside down the bottom giving this dark area at this part of the brain just up here disappear in Parkinson's and they disappear because cells that make dopamine and it's the dopamine that oxidizes that produce this brown region um, are, di are, are lost by the effect of Parkinson's disease and these are just showing those dopamine cells lighting up when a particular um, PET ligand is used and these cells project from their area down here and send fibres up into this region here to deliver dopamine, the chemical de dopamine, and to facilitate the process of learning as we've talked about at other times. Now, this is a cartoon of what's going on. So there's a nerve cell down in this region of the brain. There's axons or fibres being sent up to here and there's little boutons, as they're called, little uh, dilatations at the end where, and this is a, a sketch of or a schema of what they might, these boutons or dilatations look like. And they connect with their target cell with a little space in the middle called the synaptic cleft. And inside these terminals are bags or vesicles containing the molecule dopamine. And when a electrical impulse or a signal and the nerve cell travels down here and reaches the end, a series of events occur chemically so that these vesicles or bags uh, fuse with the membrane here and empty their contents out into the cleft. They diffuse across and bind with the receptor on the other side and make a signal to occur. So there's a series of processes which then rapidly mop up the dopamine and send them back inside for recycling. So much of the dopamine that is signalled gets reused, but there's a molecule here which is involved in the synthesis or the manufacturing of dopamine so that there's sufficient nerve endings. So the point that I want you to understand for this purposes of this talk is that for there to be sufficient amount of dopamine being released in this region, there's got to be enough nerve terminals. These terminals act like storage uh, repositories of dopamine and they release the dopamine in a regulated and organised way and it gets mopped up again so that there's just the right amount of dopamine being released. It's not flooding the area, but it's not too little. So all of the medications that are used that we currently have in Parkinson's, their purpose is to ensure that there is dopamine <coughs> being released here or that the dopamine signalling keeps on going. So the most 
uh, important of these just recently celebrated its 50th birthday. This is Levodopa and it comes in these brand names and it works by bypassing the normal biochemical synthetic mechanisms and leads to more rapid synthesis and uptake into these bags for reuse and storage. So it's most effective in the regions where there's a depletion of these terminals and it doesn't tend to have over effect in regions where there's still working nerve terminals. So it, it has that advantage that it targets the area where there's the, uh, a relative deficiency. There is a new, when I say new, it's been around for about 15 or 20 years, so quite junior compared with 50 years. These medications called dopamine agonists, and they work by bypassing this whole process and pretending to be dopamine and acting on this receptor site. And their brand names are Cifrol and a newer one called Retigotine or Nupro, which is a patch, and an old one which is disappearing because of its side effects called Cabosol. And by and large, these drugs are all very long acting, as we'll talk about soon, and these actually are shorter acting. But these drugs in themselves are not sufficient to actually alleviate the symptoms of dopamine over the course of Parkinson's over the course of the disease. So they always need the help of levodopa. So this does most of the heavy lifting, but it also causes most of the problems. So it's worked putting these two in harness that usually gets the best results. Then there are some drugs which block the clearance enzymes so that um, the, this doesn't get broken down and is available for recycling. And these drugs include Comtan and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. There's a new one called Resagiline, or um, I'll, just, I'll think of its name in a minute, but I'm thought blocking, and Selegiline, which is an older one. Um, and all of these, and this is the key point about it, every one of these drugs have the same aim, and that is to restore dopamine transmission with the purpose of fixing the slowness of movement. So they're not trying to fix tremor, although by the by they often do that. They're mainly trying to fix the slowness of movement that occurs as a consequence of insufficient dopamine. So that's their target and that's their main purpose. So in what I'm going to call stage one, that's three to six years after diagnosis, this medication works pretty well. It has a long duration of action and doesn't have uh, uh, much uh, fluctuation over the course and there's no wearing off. And there's very little disability from it in the way of side effects. And the way that I think to understand this, and the, I'm going to take a bit of time explaining this because this is important for understanding why these advanced therapies are necessary. So. We can, I mentioned before that these terminals in, under normal circumstances are a little bit like a storage device. And the tap going into this storage container here, we can think of these as the vesicles in the nerve terminal containing all the dopamine. And there's a steady rate of synthesis of new dopamine which is going into the storage capacity. These are the vesicles and then the dopamine is being released out into a pool that's available in the synaptic cleft to do the signalling. And that's the right sized pool, it's not too big and it's not too small. And it produces a pretty constant level of dopamine <coughs> inside the brain. But then when there's a diminution of terminals, the net effect is that the two things have occurred the storage capacity has now gone down, it's not as big as it was, but more importantly, the synthesis, and I've represented this as a smaller little tap here, is dripping in at a slower rate, so even though the storage is down, it's not sufficient to fill up the relatively small dam or container. And as a result, the delivery of dopamine is now much less than it should be, and so the brain level is reduced. So when medications are given, before the dose is given, we can think of this situation with the reduced dam, reduced synthesis, and so low levels coming out. 
And then when medications are given, they increase the rate of um, delivery of drug back into here, so the storage levels goes up, restoring the release back to normal for a transient period. But eventually, when the medications wear out, if, if you were just to take it one dose, eventually they would wear out and this situation would occur and things would revert back to where they were. So we have this problem that with the medications, it's low, it builds up and then falls down again. So clearly what we would like to do is to try and maintain this level as long as possible. So in stage one, the reason that treatment is relatively straightforward is because this period here of the duration of benefit of a single drug is very long. It's greater than 24 hours. And so even though the medication is often prescribed as three times a day, it very often would work quite well as just once a day or perhaps twice a day. But, and so when the medication, if you're taking it three times a day and you forget the medications, you're still up here and you don't notice any problems. And even if the medication was stopped for a day or so, you might notice any loss of symptoms or wearing off as it's called. But the arrival of this second stage is when this period or the duration of benefit progressively shortens and that's when symptoms of wearing off occurs. And what that is due to is this brief or shortened duration of benefit which can now typically come down to just a few hours. But the reason this stage brings itself to attention is that it drops to about four or five hours and so if you're taking it three times a day you become aware of the re-emergence of stiffness or feeling tight or uh, feeling weary prior to the requirement of the next dose. And we can think of it this way as now that the uh, delivery of dopamine is almost uh, non-existent and the dam is very small because there are very few terminals and so there's very little dopamine running out and now the level is very much lower. The, because the dam is low, when we take the medications there's overflow and so the levels burst up much higher than they would otherwise go. And, but there's, because there's no storage, it also wears off very quickly. And so it's this loss of the storage capacity and the reduction in synthesis that is causing two problems. One is higher levels of release and the other one is a shorter duration of benefit. And so in this second stage, that's the difficulty we're running into is that it's not only that it's lasting less time, but it's peaking and as I'm going to describe that peaking causes the symptoms that uh, come with too high a dosage of medications. So I've talked a little bit about how this manifests itself. So under normal circumstances you take the tablets and it has a very long duration of action and you take a second one long before the first one wears off and so all the time the dopamine levels are above the required treatment level. But then the stage comes where the medications peak and they wear off and so there's a recurrence of symptoms prior to the next dose. They peak again, they wear off and a new emergence of symptoms again. And as I mentioned, that's called wearing off and there's this peak dose where the symptoms are even higher than would normally occur in a person without Parkinson's. And really the only way that these levels get this high is usually with drugs of addiction in a setting where Parkinson's doesn't occur. So and the other problem that often occurs is that then when here you've still got dopamine from the day before, whereas early in the morning here there's loss of benefit and so people are um, without the benefit of the medications and um, often quite stiff and find it difficult to get out of bed or uh, get up to the toilet. And these are the characteristics of this wearing off as we call it. So why is why do we worry about this as being a problem? Well, this bradykinesia, which is the problem that the dopamine is meant to treat, um, it causes problems with balance, it causes problems with mobility, uh, dexterity, and so all of the symptoms that can cause us the significant effects on the quality of life. 
start to emerge when the dose is low or wearing off. When the peak is high, people be de begin to develop involuntary movements or dyskinesia. And these are, we've, again, at other lectures I've talked about what they are, but these are involuntary movements that get in the way of being able to carry out coordinated activities. Now, while the dyskinesias are very prominent and they're obvious to the bystander who's looking at it, they're not such a big problem for the person who's experiencing them. What is a problem, though, is that the dopamine is having a secondary effect on behaviour, such as producing impulsive behaviours. Anxiety is the stage is wearing off, and, when, and low mood and um, discomfort and an unhappy outlook on life. And these often cause a much greater disability than the involuntary movements. And one of the ways of thinking about this is that this same peak of movement occurs, as I mentioned before, if people take drugs of addiction. They result with a low level beforehand, a very sharp rise and a peak dose, in, and sometimes involuntary movements, people get twitches and other motoric behaviours. But it's on the falling phase where they begin to develop the anxiety and the craving and the looking for um, other forms of, uh, or another treatment of the medication. And it's this types of experience that are experienced, uh, types of sensations and emotions that are experienced by people in the wearing off phase of the peak dose. And then there's the re-emergence, and I've put the time course here, and you can see that this in some cases gets as short as two hours, reflecting what's happening in the bloodstream. So, Bradykinesia, we've talked about the slow movements and the slow thinking and the increase of falls which predominate there. The dyskinesia, improvements, but the more important is that they're markers of all of these other behavioural changes and uh, affective states. So these are some of the things that people notice in stage three. We've talked about the fluctuation and the unreliable responses because they're wearing off and you can't be sure of it. There's depression and then there's the sleep disturbances. Now, this is a graph here, is an example of some of the things that we can now measure by putting devices on people's wrist and measuring their movement to actually show what bradykinesia looks like. And this blue line is the measurement of the bradykinesia. Um, the time of day here is 7 till 10 at night. And the red lines here are when the medications were due. And you can see this worsening bradykinesia going down here and worsening dyskinesia up there. So this person was quite bradykinetic or off. You can see it took about 45 minutes for it to get good reasonable sort of response for about two hours, then wearing off and coming back on, wearing off and coming back on, and a little bit of dyskinesia, but not terribly much, and getting worse with each of the uh, peak doses. And one you could see is that this is wearing off after about three hours, and so a sensible thing might be to change it from every three hours where there's these peaks or re-emerging of troughs as shown by the graph here, to try and reduce it so that the next dose was coinciding when the wearing off began. So this is what the doctor, who happened to be me on this occasion, actually did, reduced them down to three hourly intervals and you can see that the blue line has now substantially smoothed out. They've got rid of the bradykinesia or the wearing off, but you can see that the price has been much worse dyskinesia. And so that's the dilemma that we're talking about is that this fine line between over-treating and under-treating or the wind therapeutic window becomes progressively narrow and it's harder to hit the right spot. So other things you can do to try and get around that is to use long-acting drugs and I've talked about the D2 agonists, the drugs that act by mimicking <coughs> dopamine and they both act quite over long periods. The Cifrol tablets has a, a duration of effect of about uh, 8 to 12 hours in the extended release form and the patch works all the time that the patch is on so it uh, do, runs out of the bloodstream after about uh, 30 minutes of taking it off. And you, if someone's having this effect then you can 
increase the, put the new pro on or the um, Cifrol to have this long duration, um, often not strong enough to work by itself, but it helps to alleviate the troughs and it means that you don't need to have quite as high a dose to get above the therapeutic window. And that's certainly an effective way of temporising for a period of a year or two, perhaps even longer. And so that's the common strategy is to put these two drugs to work together to overcome this peak and surge of levodopa. You reduce, use these long-acting drugs to help to reduce the peaks and surges and to uh, put a baseline to it. But the, this is called continuous dopaminergic stimulations, this idea of trying to get a continuous delivery and not the pulsatile ups and downs of the drugs. But as I mentioned, the con continuous drugs are not strong enough alone. And the problem is that the L-dopa drugs or in the oral preparation form are no longer continuous. They've become episodic as short as two or three hours. So the solution is to give dr the drugs by pumps so that they can be continuously delivered or to use uh, one of the deep brain stimulators. So who, again to think about who needs this, and it's a case that it's not necessary for everyone with Parkinson's disease. And this is a graph of people who are wearing the device I mentioned before, and so we were able to tell what their level of fluctuations, that, that's bouncing up and down business is, according to the duration of uh, um, since diagnosis. And this band here, the grey area, is roughly the band where we want to get the fluctuation score in. If it's below that, probably a little bit undertreated. If it's above that, then you've got this bouncing around and it's um, where we would think that it's necessary to use an advanced therapy. And at the time of diagnosis, most people are down here with not enough fluctuations with treatment. We get them up and many people stay in this band for up to 16 years and stay at that level pretty well. But you can see that some people move up here quite quickly, often within a few years of, of illness or treatment. And some people have stayed up here for quite a long time. Some of these people used to be up here, but now they've had treatment. And so as a cartoon level, what we think happens is that these are people without Parkinson's disease. And as you get Parkinson's, your movements don't fluctuate as much. And then people take two courses, one which is going to be this more benign pathway and others are going to develop fluctuations and then need some way of bringing them back down, which is the advanced therapy. So it's this group of patients who get into this category and not everyone does that we're talking about. So many people have a degree of fluctuations, but it's not troublesome. It can be managed with the oral therapies and that is true for the whole duration of the disease. And it's not that everybody is going to run into this problem. So there are three main advanced therapies. There's continuous infusion of levodopa called Duodopa is its brand name and often known as that. There's a continuous infusion of a medication called apomorphine, and I'll talk about that, but it's a, one, it's a drug that mimics dopamine. And there's deep brain stimulators, and they're the three advanced therapies, and they are each different and each have similarities. So Duodopa first. So this is the same medication that's in the oral tablets, but it's in a, in a gel and in a special preparation, which is why it's actually been difficult to develop to stop it from oxidizing. You remember that area of the brain where it lives is the, had the black marks because it oxidized, and that's the problem with dopamine. It very rapidly oxidizes and deteriorates, and so it needs to be in this gel with a whole string of antioxidants so it can continue to work. And I've drawn on this statue where roughly where the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum and the jejunum is. And a small hole is made into the stomach wall and the tube is placed in through there, threaded down through the stomach and the duodenum into the jejunum. So um, it's called a percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy or a PEG by short or a PEG sometimes it's called. 
and the there's a pump which is connected to the tube and so and the uh, small vial of the gel is inserted into the pump and so duodopa uh, or levodopa is continually being dribbled into here at a constant rate to replace the need for the oral therapies. And this is a film that's on YouTube so you can see it and this is what the tube, the pedge looks like and the tube can be easily disconnected and that's really all the connections there that are left behind. You can see there's a little bit of redness around, I'll play that again. A little bit of redness around the edge and that's commonly the case and uh, the tube sits there throughout the day entirely and this can be removed for showering or dressing or whatever the case may be. Now, the um, pump is filled with the duodopa every day. The pump is worn all the time. I'll just go back. It's, it's, it's not a uh, tiny little thing. It's quite uh, big and chunky, even though the, um, there's been lots of complaints to the drug company that they should do better. Um, and there's a tube usually sitting underneath the clothing going there constantly. So the advantages of duodopa is that it's, it's easy to use, the tubing is all outside, there's no extra things that need to be done other than the connection. It's reversible, if it doesn't work you take out the pedge, it all heals over and that's it. It doesn't, it's not um, a great complication other than that and in the grand scheme of medical fiddling it's, we think it's pretty benign even though it might not look that to you and it can be used in later stages of Parkinson's and I'm going to talk about this problem of the window later on. Its disadvantages are that uh, it does have side effects. It's beginning to emerge that there may be um, nutritional problems and it's unclear why this is. The thinking is though that having the hole there with the tube going down is actually altering the flora of the gut and so that uh, there are problems with some vitamins, there's been problems of vitamin deficiency, particularly B12, and there's also been instances of weight loss, and this again is thought to be because there isn't as much um, absorption of protein. You still get all of the side effects of having levodopa, so that if there's too much you get the dyskinesia, and uh, if there's too little the bradykinesia occurs, and so tuning the release is tricky, but there's pretty good evidence and the studies have been done that people who have these lots of fluctuations are better and their quality of life improves by taking the step to reduce these dopamine side effects. It does require some surgery, it's um, done under a very light uh, anaesthetic in much the same way as a, gastroscopy, a gast gastroscopy is done so that it's a, a day procedure and it's not terribly complicated. We usually admit people into hospital mainly to give them training and confidence about how to use the tube and how to clean it and how to get the dosage right. The tube comes out, it's uh, possible to get it caught in clothing or when bathing and um, so if it does come out then um, uh, we have to reinsert it with a, another gastroscopy effectively and so that's a, a hassle particularly if you're at some distance from the hospital. Um, diet is still a problem in that people have to be careful about what they eat and particularly if you're one of these people who have um, problems with the gut working very well which happens in the later stage where the um, gut's motility is not reliable and this is one of the troubles why oral therapies fa faded is the tablet or, or, um, are, or fail I should say is because the medications sit in the stomach and don't get properly emptied and so this problem of gastric motility or, can still be a problem in terms of the delivery of these medications and large fatty meals can actually impair the absorption of the medication. And the dose still needs adjusting, it can't just be um, dialed up and left so you ne still need to have reviews by the uh, treatment staff to see that it's right and continuous adjustment to try and tweak it and uh, get it but it's 
On the whole, it's easier to manage than oral therapies if you have this degree of fluctuations. So the next medication that I'm going to talk about is apomorphine. Now, this medication has, is really not to be confused with morphine. It's only because of its uh, that d dopamine and morphine are both alkaloids and have a uh, ancestral relationship to each other in terms of evolution from plants that uh, there's a similarity in the structure to morphine but it doesn't have the addictive properties that uh, morphine does and it's really very much closer to, to dopamine. So don't think of this that you're getting an uh, opiate. Um, it's actually a dopamine-like drug. It's a very rapidly acting medication and like dopamine, it doesn't survive very well um, in ordinary gastric setting so it can't be given by gut, can't take it orally and so it has to be injected under the skin and so the way that this is done is again it's a pump that gets filled with apomorphine every day and there's a tubing and then but the tube ends in a needle which then has to be inserted under the skin every day by someone who's got the dexterity which doesn't always happen to be the person with Parkinson's to put it under the skin. So this is what it looks like. The pump's a much nicer looking pump than the, du the duodopa one, a lot smaller. The syringe is bigger because often giving slightly bigger volumes of fluid. The needle sits underneath the skin in a patch like that. And uh, it's not any different really to giving a uh, diabetes injection of insulin except that the needle stays there all the time uh, for, or stays there for the whole day. So its advantages, it's very easy to learn to use. It's, um, um, we find that we can teach people how to give the injections by practicing on an orange and uh, within a day you're quite capable of giving it to yourself. It's reversible. If it doesn't work, it can be stopped without any great complications. It avoids all the dietary problems of delivering dopamine through the drug and it can be used in late stages of Parkinson's disease. But it has a number of side effects. The chemical, chemical itself produces quite a lot of sleepiness. Um, some of that's related to this other problem of low blood pressure, but it seems to act directly on the brainstem and cause yawning as well as the sleepiness and it often produces uh, nausea which um, can be m much more severe and in fact it, often, it originally was used as an emetic uh, when it was first discovered and um, it has all of the same side effects that levodopa has of producing dyskinesia in too high a doses and uh, um, so it's, um, its main advantage is not that it avoids these things but because it can be delivered constantly, it avoids the peaks and surges and so easy to find a steady state. There's a difficulty around getting started because of the nausea and the low blood pressure. And so there's two schools about how it should be started. Um, one is that you bring people into hospital and you switch them over from the oral therapies and you keep them in hospital until the nausea and the blood pressure is controlled. And that has the advantage that people can rapidly see the benefit of the apomorphine and are more likely to stick with it if they can survive the acute side effects of the first week, which is the nausea and the low blood pressure. The other strategy is called low and slow, which means that over a period of two months, instead of doing it in hospital, you go with a much lower dose and slowly, slowly increase it. And this avoids the low blood pressure and the nausea but it means that people have to be willing to trust you that giving all of these injections for a, week, a month or two and they can't see any benefit from it is really going to be worthwhile in the end. And so as, a, as an advisor, you have to pick uh, which patients are going to manage which approach better. Uh, as I alluded to before, there's a question, excuse me, about who does the injections. Um, if the person has the dexterity to put the injections in then they can do it themselves. The other problem is that the injections themselves frequently cause if they're not done without 
too much trauma, they cause nodules and itchiness under the skin which become quite painful. So you have to keep ensuring that the needle's put in in a new piece of real estate every day and move it around the body to avoid these and uh, then use vibrators to, um, or microwaves to reduce the amount of the nodules and be very careful and meticulous with the technique. Otherwise, those nodules prevent their long-term use. And like the other one, if the dose needs adjusting, you can't just put someone on a dose and wave them goodbye and it'll be the same one in two or three years' time. It does need tweaking constantly. So the next one is deep brain stimulation. And this is not a chemical, but it's a process of putting electrodes into the brain into two, there's several places, and I'm going to talk about that later on. And the electrodes deliver high frequency stimulation to the nerve cells in the region via a lead which uh, comes out onto the top of the, the brain here, usually about the edge of the hairline if you've got hair to have one. And then the lead is thread under the skin all the way down here to where a brain, a, a pacemaker type battery sits, much the same as if you were having a pacemaker in. It's about the size of a cigarette box and it sits in a little muscle pouch under the clavicle or the collarbone. We don't know how it works. The, there's fairly good evidence that if you deliver the stimulation at a high enough frequency, it shuts the nerve cells capacity to make signals down. So that we, the, tar the stimulator is targeted at overactive sites of the brain to make them less active and turn them off. So the disadvantage of that is that you're actually taking away some brain function to fix another area that isn't working so well. So there's always the risk that you're going to have two deficits. So you're, this area is overactive and you're shutting it down, but it's overactive usually because it's compensating for something. So its advantage is that once it's in, it doesn't require daily attention. It looks after itself, so there's no needles, no worrying about the tube where the site goes in. Um, it can be put in different locations to suit uh, parts of the brain, and I'll talk about the advantages of those for different people later on. And um, there's, but there is the problem that there's limitations on who receives it, which I'll talk to a bit later. But it does need surgery, and although the surgery from a tissue trauma point of view is relatively minor, and in fact it's done under local anaesthetic because the brain itself doesn't have any feelings or any sensation, and so there's just local anaesthetic around the skull and the skin when the uh, needles are put in, and we need the person to be awake so that it helps us locate the right part of the brain to put it into. But it carries surgical risks. Um, the needles can damage blood vessels and cause strokes. Whenever there's a foreign body in the brain or any part of the, uh, the body, there's a risk of infections around there. Every time the battery is replaced, there's a risk of putting an infection which tracks up the leads. And so these are significant problems. There are about 4% of people who don't have a good result because of one of these side effects. There's another important side effect which is cognition. And I talked before about there being a choice of places to put the electrode. So one of them is in the part of the brain that is very close to where the dopamine is delivered to, the, called the globus pallidus. It's not quite the same as dopamine but it's right next door. And this is the older site and it has less effect on cognition, but it takes about six months before the benefits become really clear and apparent. So again, I'm going to talk about the therapeutic window. Six months is lost trying to get or waiting for the plasticity and the changes in the brain for this electrode, uh, this location to work. There's a second site which has become favoured by many surgeons over the last uh, six years called the subthalamic nucleus. And it has the advantage that when it's put in there, the effects are almost immediate within about uh, a month. It 
also has the effect that it helps both the, it reduces both the involuntary movements, the dyskinesia, but also improves the amount of bradykinesia present when the medications aren't there. So it has two advantages from a motor point of view. But in a significant number of people, it seems to cause impulsive behaviours, and the reason for this is not clear, nor is the research being, has been done very well to find out just how common this is. There are some very important sites like in UCLA where a gentleman called Jeff Bronstein refuses to do it because of concerns about this. There's another important surgeon in um, Miami uh, called Michael Oaken who does it but is very, very careful about selecting patients uh, and doing a lot of care in terms of pre-surgical cognitive testing. And I think many of us now would think that this is an important preamble to surgery is to ensure that cognition is good before proceeding with surgery. And so it's not reversible in the way the other ones are and so taking the step requires care that you're selecting patients carefully. The leads sometimes become, they're threaded under the skin but they're, they're, they're flexible but they sometimes begin to irritate and extrude under the skin and that becomes quite difficult because it's hard to reroute them. Despite what you'll see on YouTube, most people still require medications, whereas, for example, with Duodopa, it's quite possible to completely get rid of medications. And the battery needs replacing probably about um, every five years, depending on the rate at which uh, stimulation uh, is being delivered and the voltage being required. Now, I've put fashion up here because um, what I'm really referring to here is that there's no, there's never been a study which compared duodopa, apomorphine and DBS together. So we can't tell you which one succeeds best under those circumstances and there probably never will be one done because of the cost of doing the study and the reluctance by the manufacturers of each version to compare their medication or their treatment head on. But apomorphine was developed in the UK. Uh, they started this in the early 90s, late 80, mid 80s, and they use far more of it than anywhere else. In fact, it's only just recently been in develop, uh, entered into the US. On the other hand, deep brain stimulation is relatively uncommon in the UK. It's not un unheard of, but it's compared with apomorphine much less common. Why is this? Well, the English developed apomorphine, the Medtronics is an American company, mainly fashion. The Swedes developed Duodopa, very high levels of usage there, far more than we use in Australia. Why? Well, their experience, their scientists develop it, they know about it. We've had DBS here for a long time, so we use much more DBS and apomorphine, although it's catching up uh, in the last year or so. Um, so the point I'm making here is that it, the, when, and I notice this, that when I talk to patients and say, well, I try and be very even-handed about what's the best and talk about the pros and cons, very often they'll come back and say, oh, I know so-and-so had deep brain stimulation, that's what I'll do. So there is an issue around fashion in choices. So I referred to the sites. Their GPI is here subthalamic nucleus is down here and the parapontine for reticular formation. People are talking about using that for stopping freezing of gait, but it's still an experimental site and I would be reluctant to use it. Generally, the argument is this is the best place for older people and this is the best site for younger people. This is in many ways a technical choice and I think that if you are thinking about it, you should be very careful in quizzing your medical advisor as to the risk of cognitive therapy, uh, cognitive um, uh, deficit. Now, the, the other important thing is that as distinct from apomorphine and duodopa, DBS has a therapeutic window. I talked about stage one, when you can give the medications without having fluctuations. Stage two, when fluctuations are usually present, and stage three is the latter stages of the illness where there is emergence of problems that are not responsive to levodopa. And these predominantly are 
problems with the autonomic nervous system, constipation, problems with swallowing low blood pressure, problems with cognition and particularly um, problems with impulsivity and neuropsychiatric um, hallucinations, etc. And some sometimes some specific problems around dementia. Now, if deep brain stimulation is done over those times, it has a bad outcome and a bad effect. And we now think that that's very unwise to actually you put um, deep brain stimulators in people who are at that stage of disease. And that's why there are people here who are untreated because they have that complication. So that means that you're left with this dilemma of saying somewhere around about three to six years the window opens and somewhere around about, this is on average, somewhere around about nine or, uh, eight or nine years the window closes. You don't really want to be putting someone up to all of the risks of surgery, which I said was about 4%, with only, say, nine months of benefit. But it's very hard to guess when the window's closing because everybody's different. So all of us are very keen to understand when the opportunity is available. And there's a recent study been done in Germany, published in a very prestigious uh, journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, showing that what they called early STEM, which is treating people when they were still right in this sweet spot, just on the edge here, that these people had a better outcome or more value because the window was, they had, were able to deploy the window longer. Now, there's still a lot of arguments about whether this is a good thing to do. These were younger patients, so they had good, a better outcome. And I think it still should be regarded as a as a moot question rather than one that we really know the answer to. But I think nevertheless there is this question about if you're thinking of deep brain surgery you should do it earlier rather than later because the longer you procrastinate the closer it is to um, the time when you can't do it. So this is what I meant by the three stages of uh, these later decline and so that we can think of there being this window opens. So DBS, the window opens when you enter stage two. No, most of us wouldn't use DBS early on because we don't know whether you're going to be one of these people who develop troublesome fluctuations or stay within the sweet spot. And if you do it too soon, you're going to end up doing surgery on people who don't need it. If you do it too late, you're doing it on people for whom the window's closed. So that's the dilemma. And it, once the, you reach this point, then DBS is usually not very helpful for you. Duodopa, on the other hand, and apomorphine are still helpful well into these stages where these problems are present. And so there isn't nearly the pressure to make up your mind to use it because the window is closing, but there is nevertheless a reason that one should think about its value and not necessarily put it off because it does improve quality of life. So I'm going to finish now by going through some questions that uh, people often ask about these. The first is, what's the long-term effectiveness? Well, the infusions act as long as the brain responds to dopamine, which is usually for the whole duration of the disease. So they continue to be effective for that time. Deep brain stimulation is remains effective at stopping dyskinesia, the involuntary movements, but it often has problems about causing increased impulsivity, particularly if it's in the long location, and often we have to turn the stimulator down to overcome the side effects. So while it's effective at doing what it was put in to do, it gets in the way sometimes of achieving other therapies. When, well I've really talked about that before, DBS, should be done on once it's as soon as it's apparent that the person involved has got troublesome fluctuations and that the therapeutic window is going to be small and that's the therapy that they want and it should be done well enough ahead of the closing of the window to get therapeutic benefit and, uh, ther and 
of uh, weighed against the cost, and I don't mean the monetary cost, I mean the medical cost to the patient of doing the surgery. Which is better? Well, we really don't know. And I think that these are then very pragmatic choices around lifestyle, the stage of disease you're at. You're, some people very sensibly think that uh, dealing with uh, my surgical cousins is a bad idea. Other people think the idea of having a tube particularly has troubles from the yuck factor and people don't like that. Um, I think it also depends on how active you are. I have a, a person who I look after who's still a surfer and he um, has an apomorphine pump. Um, the duodopa pump would be difficult. I think it would always be at risk of coming out with his surfing. But so, you know, that's a practical choice that you think people think about why you would use it or not use it. You'll still need tablets um, with DBS. You often need tablets with apomorphine to get it going in the morning. Um, about 60% of people don't need tablets with duodopa. Can you stop the advanced therapy? Well, you can turn the stimulator off with DBS, but you can't remove it. It causes the scar tissue forming around the electrode, prevents it being pulled out, and there's significant risk of causing uh, bleeding and other problems. So once it's there, it's usually there. And about the only time it's ever taken out is where there's um, infections that have occurred around the stimulators. All of the other, the other two, I shouldn't say all of them, the other two can easily be stopped at any stage um, that uh, there's a reason to. So they don't have to be, and quite often we will start with apomorphine and switch to duodopa, usually that way around, or have uh, DBS and find that we have to turn it off and then so switch to apomorphine. So it's not that once you're on one, you can't go back in the other direction. Does it matter where it gets done? Not really. I think the, like all of these things, um, you're best not to be your surgeon's first case. Um, you should see surgeons and a medical team who do enough of them. We don't know what enough is, but probably more than 20 a year is a, is a number for doing it well. And there's at least uh, what, one, two, three, four places in Melbourne do that do more than 20 a year for DBS. Um, the same goes for duodopa and apomorphine, and again, the same four do plenty of those. And so, uh, and all of them have nurses which will help you do in the administration of them. So, I think um, apomorphine in Bendigo is probably not a great idea. Um, it's not that if you're in Bendigo, you shouldn't have it, it's more that. Um, if you're in Bendigo, you still should get it done by someone who's experienced in using it and uh, have a contact with them. So that was all I had to say tonight. As always, I put up my ad for the Australian Parkinson's Registry if you're interested in participating. So I'm very happy to ask, answer some questions for a period of time. We've got a few minutes left. <coughs>